Let's pray together tonight. Father, we are so grateful again for your, your kindness and your mercy to your people. Lord, uh, we all know tonight if we're saved, if we've uh, been imputed with the righteousness of Christ, we all know where we would be tonight apart from that. Apart from you saving our, our souls, Lord, we would be where the rest of the world is on our way to a devil's hell. And Lord, uh, that gives us hope, doesn't it? It gives us hope to preach the word because it's the word that, uh, that changes hearts. It's the word that takes that mind, the Holy Spirit, through the spirit of the word, the sword of the spirit, it takes that mind that's at enmity with God and it, it opens and changes that mind so that it can comprehend the things of God. And Lord, I'm thankful for that tonight. Thank you for your work. Thank you for, uh, Lord, the message we had last Sunday, the old bloody cross. And uh, Lord, I'm so grateful for the sacrifice that was made there on the behalf of your people. And uh, Lord, uh, as you were put in the grave, and um, through the power of God, uh, were raised back bodily and physically to life. And out of that grave you came, and, and you are now seated at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for the saints. And, uh, interesting. Uh, pastor said one time that he was, uh, he, he, he died and was tried in hours. He was in the grave for days, and he's been inter interceding for the saints for 2,000 years now. And Father, thank you for that work. Thank you for Christ's work. Thank you, Father, for prayer tonight that uh, the Bible tells us over and over again that uh, the prayers as we bow our heads tonight and we speak to the God of the Bible that um, there's much comfort in that. The Bible says that our prayers come even unto your ears. And Father, we thank you for that. We're comforted in knowing that uh, we are bending our knees tonight to the, to the God of the Bible alone. Because the God of the Bible alone has the power, and we're going to look at that tonight, the authority to answer these prayers perfectly according to your perfect will. And Lord, we, uh, we rest in that tonight. We think of many who are uh, ill tonight physically and uh, Lord you know each and every circumstance um, we think of this little Gia we think of Deb and we, you know, we think of so many uh, Mrs. Nervy uh, father that are ill we think of Bonnie's um, relatives who are ill tonight and uh, Lord uh, just pray that your healing hand will be upon their bodies and as we always say right as we believe that we don't believe in faith healers. Uh, we do not believe that men can wave their hand and wave their coats and do all this nonsense that you see on TV um, and heal somebody. But we do believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. We believe in God, the great physician, who can heal at his word. So, Lord, tonight we pray for them, Father, that your will, your perfect will be done. Lord, we think tonight of, of uh, our missionaries, those whom are on our hearts as well. We think of Jeff, who um, is uh, just in the in the process of trying to figure out what you would have him and his family to do as far as sounds like this job thing is coming to an end. And so Lord, pray you open up doors there for him to go and uh, to minister there in India um, as, soon as, as soon as possible. Father, um, we think of Brother Dean and Sonia as well. Father, as you're working in their lives and as you're drawing them uh, uh, to India. Um, so, Father, we pray that as that preparation is being done, as they go once again, uh, Father, that you would use them there in a great and mighty way. And, Lord, that the church here will support them. And, and uh, Father, uh, pray for them and financially help them in those things that the church is uh, supposed to do. So, Father, we, again, pray for that situation as it, as it unfolds. Lord, um, we, we think tonight of those who aren't here that, that could be here. Father, we pray for them as well. And Father, that um, you'll give them a desire to um, come and gather with the saints, um, to come and gather around the Word of God, to sing, to bend our knees again to the God of the Bible, the Lord Jesus Christ. So, Lord, I pray for them, and I pray for those who are here tonight, that as we sing, and Father, as we open the Bible together, that, uh, Lord, you'll do your bidding, your work that needs to be done in all of our hearts. And that is the wonderful, freeing thing 
about simply trusting and relying, as we're going to see tonight, in the sufficiency of Scripture. Um, a man does not have to trick people. A man does not have to come up with his own schemes. Uh, anything like that. It's very clear in Scripture what we have been called to do. And uh, Lord, we rest in that tonight, knowing that your perfect will is done through that. And uh, Lord, it just, it's just an amazing, freeing thing. I wish and I pray that more pastors would, and teachers of the Word of God would figure that out. Instead of constantly trying to put on a show, constantly trying to trick you, constantly just trying to do man-made things to allegedly get some false conversions. And our uh, Lord, that is a dangerous thing to do. And Father, so tonight, again, we thank you for the power. The power is in the Word. The Bible says that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And so, Lord, we thank you for that tonight as well. Again, now as we stand together and open our hymnals, and sing it is well with our soul. Father, may you be honored, may you be glorified in the song tonight. And as we open the Bible, may the word penetrate our hearts. We ask now and we pray these things all in the name. The Bible says that it is above every single name. The name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and all God's people say. Amen. All right, well, let's uh, stand together tonight. And uh, let's open our hymnals to number 410. Number 410. Let's sing that together. It is well with my soul, and we'll, uh, I mean, I'm going to need to get a drink of water because I ate food, right? And uh, singing and eating food generally doesn't go very well, and so um, I need you guys really to, uh, to belt it out tonight. All right, here we go. Let's sing together all four stanzas, It is well with my soul. Here we go. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well.
seated tonight. Thank you. Good singing. I was talking to Brother Dean about that tonight, and uh, it is amazing. When you sing a cappella, <clears throat> you sing louder. Have you noticed that? Have you noticed how that works? And uh, so, um, very interesting. And it's really wonderful when you have somebody leading that can actually belt it out a little bit. You know what I mean? Instead of the weak little, uh, weak little, uh, how should we say, voice that I've got. So, what a blessing. Well, um, tonight, um, if you have your Bibles with you, turn with me to Acts chapter 1 tonight. And um, as you know, we've started the series on um, the five fundamental things of a good Bible-believing church. And uh, the last week, or the last couple of weeks, we covered the first plank of that, and of course, which is very foundational, and that is that uh, we need to have a high view of God. And um, when you have a high view of God, then, and you lay that foundation, then everything else that follows, amen, is very, 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 very important. We're building those blocks upon as we, as we understand what is and what does a good Bible-believing church believe. So we laid that foundation the last couple of weeks, and uh, tonight, it couldn't be more um, timely, should we say, couldn't be more needful for us to understand what it means to believe in the sufficiency of Scripture. Amen? The sufficiency of Scripture. Again, this is a lost teaching uh, in many, many, many areas of the world, especially in America. The sufficiency of Scripture. What does it mean? Well, let me uh, share something with you uh, again. And I talk about the relevancy of, of this very doctrine that is so very, very, very important. This past weekend, um, and... I, I don't like to, well, yes, I kind of do, I guess, um, because that's part of what a shepherd is to do, amen? A shepherd, part of what we do is, as teachers of the Word and uh, men, leaders in the church who teach the Word, part of that is to, to warn you, part of that is to give you information, amen, to watch over the sheep, to watch over the flock. That's what we're supposed to do. And uh, part of that entails um, talking about false doctrine that's out there, false teachings. And this past Sunday... There was a pastor down in Florida, and uh, just going to give you an example, excuse me. This is why what we're teaching and what we're trying to lay the foundation for, excuse me, is so important. A preacher by the name of Stovall Weems, I don't know if anybody's ever heard of him, he's the co-pastor of a Florida megachurch called Celebration Church, which has eight different campuses centered in Florida as the home campus. Other locations stretch from Baltimore all the way across the sea to Zimbabwe. The other lead co-pastor of the Celebration Church is Weems' wife, Terry, who helped plant the church in 1998. That should tell you something right there, shouldn't it? The church has an attendance of, listen, of more than 12,000 people. Think about that for a moment. That's a lot of people, amen? That's a lot of people. You see these mega churches that are full, I mean full of people. And uh, as I always say, one of the most important things when you're visiting churches like, like you are. You're, you're visiting some churches and you're trying to find one. My wife and I, when we were doing that, one of the things that we always looked at was always of utmost importance to me. And that is, what is their view of God? And what is their view of Scripture? Amen? Those two things will implant you. You'll go, because you can put up with a lot of things. Amen? You can put up with a lot of things when they have those two things right. And what I mean by that, the singing may not be the best, and, you know, they may not have the quote-unquote best kids program and all that kind of stuff, but if it's foundational and it's built on that foundation, you are in good hands. Amen? You are in great hands when that is the absolute case. Well, listen, uh, for his uh, Sunday sermon, Weems told the congregation that instead of expositing or explaining the resurrection from Scripture, he was going to tell of his own experience with the resurrected Christ. Now that, first of all, your red flag should go up immediately. Disguised in an interview format with his wife, rather than an expository message on, on, on scripture anywhere, the pastor was asked questions about his encounter with Jesus. He also asked that he be the very first one to leave the church. And I saw the tape. I watched it. Because I couldn't believe it. So I watched the video and it's like, this is exactly what he did. He said, I'm going to be the first one to leave today and then everybody else can leave after me. And you have to ask yourself, why would he say that? Because generally the pastor is the last one to leave, amen? Well, so that no one could ask him any questions about what he was about to say to the church, to the congregation. It's an amazing thing. He continued to say that there was no way he could preach a message about the resurrection on Easter when he actually saw Jesus just a few days before. 
Okay. Now you're in trouble. Now you're in trouble. We saw Jesus just a few days before. Instead of preaching about the resurrection, he said, I want to tell you about my meeting with the resurrection. And the whole place went crazy, clapped, and just went, just, just went right along with it. I mean, it's an amazing thing. And uh, he continued to say that, the, uh, oh yeah, yeah, uh, he, he wanted to talk about this meeting that he had with Jesus and the resurrection. Well, so my question to you guys tonight would be, what's wrong with that? I mean, what, what's wrong with someone saying that? Amen? So then you ask yourself, how do we check this guy, right? If the Bible's not the authority, how then do you check what he said? Amen? I mean, how do you rein him in? Then you can say anything you want, which is exactly what these men do. They just, they come up with these schemes, they think of these wild things, because there's no authority, there's nothing to rein them back in. So, we know, of course, don't we, that the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says, is anybody, it's Wednesday night, it's, a, it's, it's quiz night tonight, does anybody know where Jesus is currently at? Where is he currently at? Right. He's seated at the right hand of the Father, amen? So this guy allegedly saw Jesus, but he didn't see the Father. Well, he's seated by the Father. Why is that important that Jesus stays where he's at? Because he is currently, what? Interceding. Listen, for you and me tonight. He's currently interceding. That is one of the ministries that he, he continues. Like I said, that one pastor said it's amazing. He was tried in hours. He died in hours. He, he was in the grave for days. But he's been interceding his high priestly role for the Christian for almost 2,000 years. That's his work. That's what he's doing right now, seated there next to the Father. Of course, there's some other things, right? Peter himself says that we cannot now see Christ. 1 Peter 1, 8 and 9. Paul the Apostle said that Jesus appeared last to him, 1 Corinthians 15. I mean, he said, what, that one, as one of normally born, Christ appeared to me last of all. So in other words, this guy's in the lineage of Paul, then he's right next to Paul. And then you have the other issue, don't you? Where Paul himself, when he met the Lord Jesus Christ, was taken up into the third heaven. Remember that? 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And he saw things, what, he, what did he say? I saw things that I can't, what? I can't utter. I can't tell you. And yet... How many, brothers and sisters, of these books have people wrote, oh, I went to heaven and saw this and came back and I'm going to write a book about it. Meanwhile, the Apostle Paul, who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament inspired by God, couldn't come back and tell what he saw. It's an amazing thing. So there's so many things wrong with that, but the issue is this, brothers and sisters. The issue is the sufficiency of Scripture. What does that mean to us? What does this, uh, having the doctrine and holding to the doctrine of the sufficiency of Scripture mean? Well, last week, you remember, we got up there, we laid the foundation with the five solas. And so tonight, we're going to begin on the first one, which is sola scriptura, which means what? The Bible alone. Here's what it means in a nutshell, and I'll just give you kind of, a, kind of an overall view of what it means to believe in the sufficiency of Scripture. It means the Scriptures and the Scripture alone are sufficient to function as the role of faith for the church, which means that when we are gathered together, amen, we, we've been given by God the scriptures to tell us how to function, how to operate the things that the church should be doing. Amen? That's part of what it means to believe in the sufficiency of scripture. It means everything that one must believe to become a Christian is found in scripture and no other source. That's what it means. It means that a person can go to scripture, amen, open up the scriptures and go, I can read and figure out as God draws me to the cross how to get saved. You don't need any other outside sources. That's what it means to believe. Now, I'm not saying you don't read other sources. It's good to do that. I do a lot of that. It's okay to read other good, solid men. But the idea here is the sufficiency of Scripture. And that is that it is our source, our sole source of authority of what the church should be doing. It means the Scriptures are not in need of any other elements or supplements. That's what sufficiency means. It means that it's full, that everything is there that we need. That's another element of the sufficiency of Scripture. It means the Scripture's authority comes from their nature as God-breathed revelation. That's what it means. When you believe in the sufficiency of Scripture, this is what it means. It means that the Scriptures are what? God-breathed, and we're going to look at that and what that means. It also means that Scripture's authority is not dependent upon men, listen, or upon a church or some council. Now, there's nothing wrong with the church. God, the Lord Jesus Christ died for the church. But that's not what the authority of Scripture is bound upon. Amen? It's not upon a church. It's not upon a council. It's not upon men. 
Here's the caveat. What a man, church, or council says is only and can only be considered truth if it does not find itself in direct contradiction with the scriptures. That's what it means. So what happens is, because all of us are prone, amen, all of us are prone to veer off and those sorts of things. And uh, what we have to do is, when we come across something in Scripture, we are the ones that change. The Scripture doesn't. Amen? It's like I've, I've told that, I've used that illustration, my stepdad was a pilot for many, many moons. Amen? Many moons. And he tells the story about learning how to fly with an instrument. He said it was the weirdest thing because he went into this simulator and literally, uh, you're in this thing, and you get in clouds, and I, and I don't understand how it all works, but literally, you can fly upside down and not know you're upside down. It's, it's an amazing, stunning thing. And he said the hardest thing for him to do, because he flew a sight, he did a lot of that, but following it, looking at that instrument, and that instrument's telling him, I'm upside down. And he said, the hardest thing for me to do was to follow that thing and get myself right side up. I felt like I was okay, amen? But I wasn't. So... The instrument's telling me that i got to get back right side up. That's what Scripture does on a continual basis. Because, brothers and sisters, we are prone. We are prone to wander off. We are prone to have our own ideas. We are prone to do that. And we see it over and over and over and over again. And um, that's why we harp on it a lot here. That's why we're constantly warning people here, constantly. Because we must be ever vigilant. Amen? We must be ever vigilant to, to hold to and believe in the sufficiency of Scripture. Why is that? Because God who is infallible. God who is infallible. Anybody know what the definition of infallible is? It's Wednesday night. What does infallible mean? Can I, can I tell you what it means? I'll just give you the definition. It means incapable of error. It means incapable of error. What that means is that God, who is infallible, is incapable of writing a fallible book. He would never write something fallible and try and trick us or lie to us. Amen? Does, does anybody know, is the word infallible found in Scripture? Does anybody know? Can I show you? So you don't think I'm making it up, right? That's, that's what you got to be a Berean. You have to check the Scriptures. Is it what Pastor Mike's saying? Is what Brother Dean's saying? Is what, you know, whoever's teaching, is, is it in Scripture? I'm glad you asked. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Acts tonight. Look at the book of Acts. And again, keeping in mind, this word infallible means incapable of error. This is what it means. Look at verse number 1. Acts chapter 1, look at verse number 1. The Bible says, The former treaties have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles, whom he had chosen. Now look at verse 3. To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many what? Infallible what? Proofs. Hey, it wasn't just one infallible proof. The Bible says there were many infallible proofs. And we could go through scripture and we could look at something, but that's not the intent here. The intent is to understand and know that that word infallible means it's impossible for error. In other words, when the Lord Jesus Christ rose from the dead, he went around and proved by infallible proofs that he rose from the grave. When you and I, when we were this weekend, we're, we're, uh, we're celebrating his resurrection. We're not believing something just on blind faith. There is infallible proof that he rose physically and bodily from the grave. This is what the scripture teaches. This is what it says. It's an amazing thing. Now, Turns me to Psalm 119. We're going to look at some, a lot of verses tonight just because um, the Scripture speaks of many, 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 many of these kinds of things. Look what the Bible says here. You and I can trust the authority, the sufficiency of Scripture. Psalm 119. And uh, look there at verse number 160. A lot, a lot of verses in Psalm 119. Huh? Look at Psalm 119. Look at verse number 160. 60. Look what the Bible, uh, the Bible says there. The Bible says that thy word is what? Yeah. True from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endure forever. And so what, what the psalmist is doing, he's laying out this infallible word. This, this word that is incapable of error. That's what he's laying out there, and that's what it means, part of what it means to believe in the uh, sufficiency of Scripture. Let me show you this. Peter himself was extremely concerned 
uh, as he was getting ready, you know, the Lord told him, right? You remember back in John chapter 21, the Lord told him, you know, you're going to be, they're going to take you to a place you don't want to go. Amen. Here, he warned Peter about his crucifixion or the, his death that he was going to face, just like he did to Paul. And you remember that in John chapter 20. Turns me to 2 Peter. I want you to see this. Peter lays again some, some groundwork for those who were with him, those whom he know he was, and he was told by God, of course, that uh, by the Lord Jesus, that uh, the kind of death that he would face. And he says this here, 2 Peter uh, chapter 1. Look at verse number, um, look at verse number, uh, let me see, did I write that down right? 2 Peter 1, verse number 16. Um, boy, I didn't get that right, did I? Hold on. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Oh, I'm in 1 Peter, that's why that doesn't look right. Yeah, look at verse number 16. 2 Peter chapter 1, look at verse number 16. I want you to notice something here again. Peter has uh, just told them in the prior verses about his approaching death. I'm about ready to die. Remember we talked about, I want you to be in remembrance of these things. He tells, we use that word three times in the verses preceding here. In verse 16 he says, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were what? Eyewitnesses of his majesty. What does that mean? It means that there's a testimony there of them seeing the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? We were eyewitnesses. We saw him. Amen? Look at the second thing there. Look at verse number 17. There's a testimony of sight, you could say. Look at verse number 17. For we received from God the Father honor, or for he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a what? Voice. Such a voice of him to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So here we have two, don't we, of our senses being mentioned. What? Sight? And now what? Hearing. So in other words, there's a testimony of sight. There's a testimony here. They heard and saw the Lord Jesus Christ themselves. It's an amazing thing. Now look at that. What else? He cements it a little farther along. He says, hey, we've heard it. We've seen it. Now look what he says there in verse number 18. He says, and this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy what? Mountain. So we saw him, we heard him, and we were physically present with him. Amen? So that, that's pretty strong testimonies, isn't it? I mean, that's pretty strong to be <laughs> hearing him and seeing him and living with him like they did through all of his ministry here on the earth. Now look what Peter says. This is very important. Look what he says there. Verse 19. We have also a more sure what? Word. Do you see that there? We have a more sure... Look, we've seen him. We've heard him. We were there physically with him. And then he says, but we have a more sure what? Word of prophecy. Look what he says there. Whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star rise in your hearts. Verse 20. Knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture is of a private interpretation. Do you understand what he's saying? We heard him, we saw him, we were physically there, and I want you to understand the importance of the word. This is what he's saying. Because you know what never changes? The word never changes. You know what is going to change? You know what's going to change? Is their memory of what they saw. You know what else is going to change? Their memory of what they heard. We've all It's happened to all of us. We think we remember something a certain way, we've seen it, we've heard it, and yet, like my daughter, I talked about that, her little diction, her little, uh, what do they call that? Diary thing. She finds it ten years later, looks at the situations that she had written about, she looks at me and goes, I don't remember it that way, and neither will you. This is what Peter is saying. We've heard him, we've seen him, we've been there physically, but brothers and sisters, we have the more sure word. Which, by the way, had not an interpretation of any man. Okay? Look what he says here. This is why it's so important that we get a hold of this. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men. I like that, don't you? Holy men, whom God used. Look what he says. But holy men spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. That, brothers and sisters, is the groundwork 
for sufficient, the believing in the sufficiency of Scripture. There's so many things that are tied in. When you believe in the sufficiency of Scripture, it means you believe that Holy Writ contains the authority and the power of God to accomplish all of His purposes. Do you believe that tonight? Do you believe that God's Word contains the authority and the power to accomplish that for which He sends it? I do. Amen? This is part of it. Look at Isaiah 55. Again, a very familiar portion of Scripture to us. Um, Isaiah chapter 55. For some of us, this is good review. Uh, it's good for me. It's good for me to remember these things. Amen? And to, and to look back and say, well, uh, Pastor Mike, why do you believe that? Why, why does your church believe that? Why does your church hold to these sacred doctrines that have been taught? Well, because they're extremely biblical and very important. Amen? But what I want you to notice here, you know, God, when He teaches in Scripture, does He not use many times illustrations and things that we can understand? So when he writes and has Isaiah under the inspiration of God here, as Isaiah is carried along, he has him write down this illustration so that you and I, amen, can comprehend and grasp what he's trying to say. Amen? Look here at Isaiah 55. Look at verse number 8. Isaiah 55, look at verse number 8. Look what the Bible says there. Ah, for my thoughts are not your what? Thoughts. Do you see the problem we have? This is the real issue when you get away from the, from the authority of Scripture, from believing in the sufficiency of it, is that your thoughts are not his thoughts. His thoughts are recorded by the under inspiration here that never change. Your thoughts change, my thoughts change, my feelings change, your feelings change. God's word never changes. Funny, isn't it, how we can get off and he just, whew, you get back into Scripture and it just, it just funnels you back into those fundamental Bible-believing things. It really is an amazing thing to behold and watch. Look what he says there, Isaiah 55. He says in verse number, uh, verse number 8, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. Now look at verse 9. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain cometh down, this is what I'm talking about. He just said that his ways are higher than ours, his thoughts are higher than ours, and then he says, hey, as the rain comes down, we can understand that, can't we? Well, not now, uh, because it's snowing. <laughs> but what he's doing, he's teaching us something here. He says, he says, For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from the heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it to bring forth bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I, what? Please and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. Do you understand the importance of what Isaiah just penned there? There's no need for people to get up and create this man-made thought that you met with Jesus on Friday, all right? Because I can tell you right now, he did not meet with Jesus on Friday by the authority of Scripture. What he should have done was got up and he should have exegetically preached on the resurrection of Christ. That's what he should have done. Now he's created something. It's, it's an amazing, you, I'm going to watch this thing close to see how haywire this thing really goes because it absolutely will go. His word's going to go forth. So men preaching the word, guess what it's doing? That's why when I preach on Sundays and Dean preaches on Sundays and we leave Sunday school, that's why we are constantly doing this. That's why you're hearing your Bible pages flip. Because we want to know what saved God. That's what we want to know. That's the power. Amen? Do I sound like a broken record? It's constant with me. It has to be. It must be. Because my thoughts will wander. My ways will wander. We must stay with the authority. Look at Matthew 28. Let me show you this here. Just a a few scriptures here for us to look at tonight. Look at Matthew chapter 28. <clears throat> look at verse number 17. And we, we understand what's happened here. The Lord Jesus Christ is uh, getting ready to ascend up to heaven. And uh, he's giving them his final words as he's going to lead them. And the Bible says in verse 17, 
And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All what? Power. Make sure you underline that. How much power? All power. Listen, all of it. Now this goes, brothers and sisters, where we're going to lead with this, again, is understanding when we get into um, salvific things. Soteriology. What it all, it's all tied together. It's an amazing thing. When we get into that, you're going to see what it means for God to have all power. Look at what it says. Is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Look at Acts chapter 1. Just to, We're going to kind of flush this out a little bit. Look back at Acts chapter 1 again. And uh, it's a great place to spend some time in the book of Acts. Amen. The beginning of church history and uh, inspired church history that we have. Look at Acts chapter 1. Uh, look at verse number 6. There's, there's three words here in verse 6. Seven that we're going to look at. But look at verse number six, right before his ascension. When they therefore were come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the what? What's that word? The times. Nor or the what? Seasons. Which the Father hath put in his own what? Power. Now it's very important to understand what Jesus is saying here. All right? Now, the word times there means duration of time. In other words, how long is it going to last? Amen? So God has put in his own, by his own authority and his own power how long this earth is going to last. How long this eon is going to go on. How long this age will go. God by his own authority, by his own power has set a date when this is going to end. Now look at what else. Not only does he, does he deal with the time, how long it's going to go, but also the what? What's that next thing? The seasons. By his own authority, he has dictated and has a power over, not only how long it's going to go, but the seasons literally means the events that are happening within that time. So in other words, God is all authoritative. God is sovereign. God has all power, not only the length of it, but also all of the things that go on within the length of that time. Aren't you thankful to tonight? I'm grateful that God is all authoritative, that he has all power. Now that word power means potentate. You ever heard of that word, potentate? Potentate. I've got to get that out of the T. I have a tendency sometimes to leave one T out of there. Potentate. You know what that word means? It means that you have the authority to give orders. And, listen, not only to give the orders, but to enforce obedience. Amen? That's what it means when you are a potentate. That's the authority and power that God has. And how can we illustrate, how can we demonstrate this tonight? Well, again, by the Scripture. The things, the lessons, the things that God has recorded in Scripture for us. Look over here. I want to show you this because as we lead into where we're going with all of this, by the time it's all done, amen, we're going to get into some very interesting doctrines, I promise you. We're going to get into predestination. We're going to get into foreknowledge. We're going to get into God's elect. I mean, it's all going to come down. It all comes together. It all boils together in what you believe about the potentate God himself. Right? People say, don't they, that God does not control men. You ever heard that? You've heard it. You've heard it said, haven't you? Well, God has no plan. That's what some men teach. God has no plan. Some men teach that God has a plan, but it's not specific. And then there are those, like myself, who believe that God has a very specific plan. And that he is working it out perfectly according to his perfect will. There is nothing. There's not an atom. There's nothing that goes amiss from his sovereign hand. Period. Nothing. So look with me, if you would, just a couple of illustrations tonight from the authority of the Word of God. Look at Genesis chapter 20. Brother Dean, would you read that? Genesis chapter 20. Let's turn there together. And uh, you want to see power? You want to see potentate? 
You want to see authority in men. Here's a couple of examples we're going to look at. Look at Genesis chapter 20. And look at verse, uh, verse number 4. And then read through verse number 6. Genesis chapter 20, verses 4 through 16, if you would. But Abimelech had not come near her, and he said, Lord, wilt thou slay also a righteous nation? Said he not unto me, she is my sister? And she, even herself, said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and innocency of my hands have I done this. And God said unto him in a dream, Yea, I know that thou didst this in the integrity of thy heart. For I also withheld thee from sinning against me. Therefore suffered I thee not to touch her. All right. What, what happened here? Does anybody, do you remember the, the story, what's happening here? Abraham and Sarah, right? Tell them half truths. You know what I mean? Isn't that funny how we're so much like our parents sometimes? But you see that here. He lied to King Abimelech. King Abimelech takes Sarah as his wife. Right? Now what do kings do with their wives? You don't have to guess. Okay? You don't have to guess what they do. Right here, the Bible says that God withheld Abimelech from touching her. Amen? God does intervene. God does intercede in the will of man. And he does stop them from doing certain things. No question about it. That is power. That's, that's potentate. That's when God wrote in Proverbs 21, right? As the king's heart is in the hand of the, as, a, as, a, as a river, and he directs it however he will. There's so many scriptures that deal with the sovereignty of God. Not just in salvation, but in the very times and seasons that we're talking about. The very events that are going on inside the time that he has allotted. He is sovereignly controlling all of it. There's not a sawdust, as Spurgeon said, there's nothing that escapes his sovereign hand, not one thing. Nothing. If there is, brothers and sisters, you and I are in big trouble. You understand that. That means that God is not in control of all things. And he is potentate. He is sovereign over all things. Look at Jeremiah chapter 18, just another passage of scripture there, just some Old Testament passages for us. Look at Jeremiah chapter 18. <clears throat> you ever seen on TV, uh, interesting, um, Wendy and I used to watch this, uh, I don't really want to say, <laughs> you know, uh, one of these guys that has a, like a pencil protector in his pocket, and that has some pens in there, you know what I'm talking about, one of those guys, and he was, he, remember he was, he was doing clay stuff, remember? And I'd laugh because he's pumping this thing up and this thing's spinning around. He's got water on his hands and he's... And it was amazing to watch him. You know why? Because as he's doing that, that clay is molding exactly to the will of the potter. It's an amazing thing to watch that. It was so fun. And I'd laugh till like, oh, look at that. And they'd go like that and the thing would go, woo, and he'd woo, and it would go back. Whatever the potter will, that clay did. You understand that? It's an amazing thing. It really, really is. Now listen how God describes his relationship with us. His relationship with Israel, first of all. Look here, if you will. Look at Jeremiah. Look at Jeremiah uh, chapter 18. Look at verse number 1. The word of the Lord. <laughs> oh, the word which came to Jeremiah from who? From the Lord. Again, what we're seeing here is this holy man of God being carried along by God. He's writing down what God wants him to write. Amen? His personalities here, all of those things, right? That's why we believe in what we call dual authorship, right? You know what dual authorship is? Dual authorship is what we're going to talk about here in a little while. And it means that these men were carried along. God so superseded their, uh, their writing that their personalities were kept intact, intact, but they wrote every word exactly as God intended it to be written. That's what it means to be inspiredly written. It means that there's dual authorship. God oversaw that they wrote exactly. This is what he's saying. Jeremiah is saying here, Hey, which came from the Lord, saying, Arise, and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought at work on the wheel. So here's, here's Jeremiah. Amen. He's, again, using an illustration that they're going to look at and go, I get that. Just like I did with that nerdy guy on, 
on PBS when he's doing that thing. I knew exactly what he was doing. I understood exactly what was happening. He was molding that thing perfectly according to his will. Not yours, not mine, his. Amen? He says there, And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again another vessel that seemed good to the potter to make it. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, can I, cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's what? Hand. So are ye in my hand, O house of Israel. Amazing how um, easily God in his graciousness is showing us what, he, what this means. As you're in the hands of the potter, as the clay is, he will do what he wills with it. Look at Romans chapter 9. Again, just another passage of Scripture tonight. Look at Romans chapter 9, the same concept. Now, there's six passages in the Old and the New Testament that deal with God, who is potentate, all sovereign. He is the potter, we are the clay. Look at Romans 9, look at verse number 21. And again, this is kind of a general overview, laying the word here, the, the, the whole idea here of the sufficiency of Scripture and what it means that we can trust in what God says because He is all authoritative. He has all power. He is sovereign over all things, including the Word. Amen? All right, so look here. Look at Romans 9. Look at verse number 21. Look at verse number 21. Hath not the what? Father. What's that next word? Power. Power. That's the same word. That means potentate. He which gives orders and then sees that it takes place. Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? What if God willing to show his wrath and to make his power known endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted for what? Destruction. That he might make known the riches of his glory and the vessels of what? Mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory. Now there's a lot, there's a lot of doctrine here. There's a lot of things that we'll delve into it later on when we get into soteriology. But the idea here is God is the potter. And God molds and bends that clay any way he wills. Amen? Just like that guy on the wheel. Huh? You know, I'll never forget that. It's so funny because I can still hear it. Thum, 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 thum. And there he is going to town. I said, that is exactly what God's teaching in Jeremiah. He's teaching it in Isaiah. He's teaching it in Romans. He's teaching it through all of Scripture. That he is sovereign and potent king. Aren't you glad tonight? Aren't you glad tonight that God is sovereign in all things? Oh, it's so important. And why is that important to us tonight? Is where oh, the sun is coming in. <laughs> now I can't see you guys. We got watches in front of my eyes. Why is that so important, brothers and sisters? Because of a foundation. Everything, everything. Everything hinges on what God's Word says. Everything. Everything we believe. Everything the church does. Amen? You know what, what his name was teaching? Again, a large megachurch. Andy Stanley, the devil himself. Hissing words out of his mouth that only a devil would say. You remember what he said. We should not tell people the Bible says. Remember? I preached on that a while back. Listen. In Hebrews chapter 7, the author writes there about Jesus saying, It is written of me in the volume of a what? A book. We believe it because it's written in the book. Mm -hmm. Amen? It must be that way, brother. It has to be that way. Because there's a lot of things I read in Scripture... I can tell you tonight that I don't understand. Amen? But I believe a lie. Because I believe in the sufficiency and the authority of God. I can't explain some of it, and neither can you. And I'm thankful tonight that I can. Because then God would be on my level. <laughs> Amen? And you remember what he said? My ways are higher than what? Your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. But take heed, brethren, 
Because as the rain comes and the snow falls, and as the earth is saturated and it grows like I designed it to do, so my word will do the same thing. Amen? It's such a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful thing. Boy, is it 8 o'clock already, Beth? Yep. How did this happen? How does this happen? <laughs> well, uh, next week, amen, uh, turn with me in your Bibles to 2 Timothy. I want to, I want to show you where we're going to, where we're going to pick up next week. And again, we're going to delve into some things just because I want to spend a lot of time on this. Because as you know, think about this for a moment. Satan, when he was addressing Eve, you remember the four words he used? When he slithered up to Eve, Yea, hath God said. Amen? You remember that? You remember when Satan showed up after the Lord Jesus Christ was uh, fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, and he was a hungry. The Bible says that. You remember what Satan did? Um, it is written. Right? It is written. And Jesus then, in turn, replied back and said, It is what? It is written. You remember what he did in Matthew chapter 4? He, mis he misquotes Psalm 91. Remember that? I, we talked about it. Here you have the devil himself standing before the one who wrote the very scripture he's, ta he's talking about, and he misquotes it to him. Leaves a portion of it out, which is exactly what they did in the garden, which is exactly what he did there, which is why, brothers and sisters, we must continually... Listen, I'm gonna, by the time this is over, it's going to be a broken record. But you know who else was a broken record? Paul was, Peter was, the prophets were, over and over and over again. The word, what does it say? It is written. Amen? So 2 Timothy chapter 3. Let me show you where we'll be next week. Look at verse number 14. You remember, don't we, that Paul's writing to young Timothy here. Look at what it says there in verse 14. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And that from a child thou hast known the what? Yeah, the Holy Scriptures, not his thoughts, not his understanding, not someone's book, not someone's commentary, which they're okay as long as they're sound. But that's not what Paul tells Timothy to trust in. Just like Peter told them, like those men, don't trust in what you've seen. Don't trust in what you've heard. Trust in what's written. Because what you see and what you think and what you emotions and all, I can bring it all in there. It'll all change. His word will never change. That's what's so wonderful. Listen, it says there, knowing the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto what? Sure. Salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Now look at that next word, verse 16. What is it? All, all Scripture is given by what? Inspiration of God. And it's profitable for four, and it's good for four things. Look at here. We're going to break this down. Look what it says. It's profitable for what? Doctrine. Doctrine. You do know doctrine is a dirty word today. I can tell you that right now. All you got to do is mention doctrine. And people are going to, they want to fight. Oh, you're divisive. You're one of those guys. You're one of those people who believes in doctrine. Yes, I am. And so was Paul, and so were any good men who have ever been worth anything a salt at all. Well, doctrine divides. Yes, it does. And we'll see this next week. And you know what? Let me tell you this. That's exactly what God designed it to do. You get that, don't you? It divides truth from error. It divides light from dark. It divides all kinds of things. And that's what it's designed to do. God designed it for that. That's one of the purposes. It, is, it does divide because it's designed to do that. Amen? But look what it says. It's profitable for doctrine. We're going to look at that. What's that next for what? <laughs> reproof. Boy, people don't like that, do they? It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction. Sometimes we need to be corrected. And it's the Bible that corrects us. Amen? And I'll tell you what, dealing with people, over my 25, 26 years, 
as a pastor, as a teacher of the Word of God, one of the things people do not like is to be corrected. Brothers and sisters, you better be humble enough tonight to be corrected. Myself included. Amen? You better get under the authority of the Word of God and be corrected by the Word of God. That's what you better do. Did I just lose that? Yes. Hey, my parts are falling off. <laughs> we'll finish up because it's already, it's time. But, um, so we're going to look at that. For correction. Look at the third thing there, what it says. This doctrine, this Bible is good for. For instruction in what? Righteousness. Righteousness. Why? Look at verse 17. That the man of God may be perfect, may be mature, may be grown up. All right? The King James uses man. It means, ladies, you're not left out, okay? Uh, the King James Bible loves you too. Amen? <laughs> Man, it just, it just uses that word. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all what? All good works. That's a major teaching, brothers and sisters, on the sufficiency of scriptures. Those four things next week. We'll look at what it means to be God-breathed, because that's very important. It goes right back to the authority. It goes right back to sovereign God. What does it mean the word is God-breathed? What does it mean? Well, we're going to look at that. What does it mean to be corrected? What does it mean to be reproved? What does it mean to be trained in righteousness? We must get all that laid out there because, again, it lays the groundwork for all that's coming. I have a question, though, and then we're finished. <clears throat> How did we get our canon, the Bible? That's the question for next week. Okay? How did we get it? How did we get the Old Testament? How did we get the New Testament? What is the Old Testament? What does it contain? What is the New Testament? What does it contain? Amen? And we'll look at that. There's going to be, I think I'm going to put it up on the, some of it up, because there's going to be a lot of numbers there. Second Timothy was written in about 67 AD. And so when he wrote here, all scripture is given by inspiration, it's profitable. There were some other scriptures already that had been in place. Dean, you even talked about that. I think it was last Sunday, you made mention of that. And we're going to see how it was compiled. Brothers and sisters, the Catholic Church did not give us our Bible. Okay? As much as everybody likes to think that that happened, by the authority of Scripture, I can show you that that's not the case. That it was put together long before the Catholic Church ever popped its, its head up. Amen? So we'll look at that. How did we get it? Why do we believe that these 66 are supposed to be here? Amen? Not the other 12. Not some other, not the Gospel of, of uh, Thomas. Right? Not the Book of Enoch, which is mentioned in Scripture. Amen? Why do we have the ones we have? Isn't that important? Don't you think that's important that we know that? Mm -hmm. When someone says, well, why do you believe the Scripture is any better? You know, what's different from that than the Quran? What's different here? What's, why do you guys have that? That's foundational to everything. Amen? So we'll take a look at that uh, next week. And um, a couple of other things as well. There's a, there's a lot of things here I got in my notes, but we'll, uh, we'll finish that up next week. Okay, all right. Anybody have any uh, final thoughts or comments before we, uh, before we dismiss tonight? I, can't, I couldn't see you anyway if you raised your hand because I've been blasted by that sun about nine times. Amen. Wow, nobody has any questions. This is amazing. All right, any thoughts? All right. Good, good, good. Good stuff, amen? I mean, it's just, it's wonderful foundational stuff. For some of us, it's, it's, to be quite honest, it should be elementary stuff, but it's not. Amen. So, um, I remember one time I was teaching on the canon, and uh, somebody was sitting, and they came up to me afterwards because they didn't want to ask what it was. So I have to be ever careful because sometimes I just assume that people know what it is. If there's anything, if I'm going along and you say, what? I've never heard. What is that? Please ask. Amen? Please inquire. Well, canon means rule. That's what I told him. That's what it literally means. That's what that word means. And uh, our rule of authority is here. He was thinking a cannon, like a, you know what a cannon? It shoots a metal ball out. He wasn't sure what that meant. So, amen. All right. All right.
Anybody else? Wonderful. I'm going to ask Brother Dean to pray for us, close us, and then uh, I think, are we practicing tonight? Are we awake enough to do that? Elizabeth, are you, uh, amen. Isaac? Yep. You good with that? Elizabeth, you good with that? Amen. All right, here we go. Well, let's, uh, let's pray together tonight, and then we'll, uh, Father, we uh, thank you. Oh, Brother Dean, go ahead. Sorry. Our Father can help but to be thankful tonight that you have given to us your word, the scripture. I'm thinking of in the book of Hebrews where it says he spoke in sundry times and in diverse manners in the past, and yet you have also given to us the scriptures and writing. It's amazing for us to think that if we would not have your word in writing, how astray we would all go so much in so many different directions. And we know that those who are not true believers will go astray into damnable and horrible teachings, even though you've given to us the word, but I am amazed and we are amazed at how you give us the scriptures and by your grace you keep us faithful mm -hmm. as we stay true to what you have given to us. Lord, we pray that you would give to each of us here the grace to stay true to your word yeah. and to remember that none of us have come to fully understand your word and we have much mm -hmm. growing to do. We have much understanding to gain and it never ends in this life, and we pray that you would just use your word by the power of the Spirit to grow us in sanctification. We pray that that would be the case for each of us, and for this local church also. We pray that this church would not go straight from your word. We know that we are in a day of great apostasy. We know we are in a day of great corruption, and Pray that you would preserve us. Amen. Keep us faithful, we pray. We pray that you would keep us from deception. We pray that you would keep us from false teaching that would lead us astray from a clear word. As we go through this series on Wednesdays, we pray just for continual growth and thanksgiving. I can't help but to just be thankful tonight for being so gracious give to us your word. May we have further appreciation for it. Yeah. May we judge everything by it. May you illumine our minds that we may know it accurately. But we cannot unless you give us that hunger, that thirst, and that understanding. Guide Mike as he teaches through the series. Draw us close to you in prayer. And we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.